Good morning. And welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone who is here on this special Sunday where we remember Palm Sunday when Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem. Welcome to everyone who is here in this place and space and time. Welcome to those who are joining online now or later. We pray that together we can give our uh, praises, our glory to the King of Kings and also be equipped to serve him in extravagant ways today and all week long and the rest of our lives. God is present in this place, and one of the ways that we know that he is present is he welcomes us. I'd like to invite you to rise in body or in spirit to receive God's greeting. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, who is present here in this place. And together the people of God say, Amen. Amen. God has greeted us. Let's uh, greet one another with a kind and encouraging word. Sing unto the Lord. Sing unto the King. Sing to Jesus. Jesus the King. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the King. Spread your palm leaves before him. Jesus the King.
song, we're going to do Praise Ye the Lord, Hallelujah. And we're going to sing it through two times, and then we want you guys to join us. So on the last time, we will do the Hallelujah part, and you guys have to do the Praise Ye the Lord. And it gets tricky because you have to stay standing <laughs> for two Praise Ye the Lords. It gets tricky. We'll see if you can do it. Okay? Well, I'll help you out. Okay? The very same people who sang Hosanna on Sunday cried crucify him on Friday. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one.
The very same Peter who said he was ready to die with Jesus denied him three times that very same day. There is no one who understands. agreed to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver on Wednesday, sat with him at the Lord's Supper the next day. There is no one who seeks God. drank with Jesus at the table, deserted him, and fled that very same night. All, All have, have turned away. away. They, they have together become, become worthless. worthless. There, there is, is no one who does good, good. not even one. have denied him, betrayed him, rejected him, and crucified him. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. in prayer. Dear Father, your deep, deep love for us is far beyond our understanding. Hear our prayers of silent confession. You made us for yourself as your spirit hovered over the waters and we were created in your image. The world was made through him who became flesh and came to his own who did not receive him. As we worship you this morning and in this holy week, we thank and praise you, Father, for giving up your Son who died for us and giving us your Spirit who lives in us. Yes, Lord, we are weak and helpless children in need of a Father to hold us, a brother to save us, and a friend to lead us home. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We love you. Amen. Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, 
the Holy Spirit is indeed present as we continue our work, and part of that work is uh, partnering with others, and we partner through, in lots of ways, but also including our financial support, and our offerings today are going for CRC ministry shares, as well as, like usual, for TC Ed. And talking about TC Ed, I would like to invite Kurt to come forward. He has a few comments to make about TC Ed, and then Pastor Dan is going to come forward, and he has a couple of comments about next week's offering. And uh, Merle, is this green microphone okay? And uh, it is on for you, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Um, I was asked to come up and talk to you about a few things, like Pastor Stan said. But first, I want you all to know, just in case you're curious, uh, we raised enough money Wednesday night to uh, get the castaways off the island. <laughs> and if you weren't at the big show and don't know what, you're ta- or what I'm talking about, I just want you to find the gorilla and ask him the question, Okay. So, first of all, I want to talk to you about what's on this page that you all got in your mailboxes. As you can see, if you look in the bottom, it shows that we are all paid up for the year. Praise God for that, right? (laughs) But I don't want you to feel like we're done, because I don't think we're ever done raising money for our kids. But we'd want to thank you, thank you, thank you for all your dedication to Christian education, to donating, to working at all these projects. It's a huge undertaking, and we just want you to understand that we appreciate each and every one of you for all your efforts and your commitment to this, okay? So with that being said, we decided to put in front of you a challenge. We would like... Um, to set a goal for the first quarter of next year to be paid for before school starts. And if you look at the bottom, there's $26,000 in there. So that means we got a little ways to go before the 1st of September. So just prayerfully consider what you've been doing or where we're going with all of this. And if it spirit leads, please continue to give. We also want you to know that we as a committee are not slowing down either. In today's, in your mailbox, you find that there are brought fundraiser, and that was put in all of the parents with kids in school. So we're going to start today, and the orders are due on the 23rd. Um, as it says here, it's a perfect way to fill your freezer for the summer. I also want to put in front of you anyone that... Uh, does not get contacted, does not have uh, kids or grandkids or anyone they know in school, we're going to put one of these on the back information table. And you can fill it out, put your, uh, your dollars or your check in my Kirtman Holland personal mailbox, and I will take care of it. And I have decided that I will deliver any of them that have it on my form. Not that I want to show everybody that I'm selling more, that's not it. Um, But I want everybody to be able to buy some and to get some. And if you don't get contacted, please don't be afraid to put it on this form. And then God put it on my heart, except for those that are listening on the Internet, I don't want to go to California or Arizona to deliver. So my wife might like that, but I don't know if I would. So just keep that in mind, okay? Secondly, we're going to do um, tractor pull gate again this year so we will be having a sign-up sheet for that in the near future I believe we need 40 or thereabouts people to take the gate Um, so if you want to get in for free there's an opportunity so please sign up and thirdly uh, I didn't realize all of the work that goes into pig in the blankets and I just thought it happened in November and it was over that's how naive I am um, we need, are looking for people to donate beef and pork for next November. So if you are willing to do that, either the actual animal or financial donations toward that actual animal, we really need to do that soon because I didn't realize how long it takes to get that all done. So please prayerfully consider that as well. Um, just keep us in your thoughts and your mind that, you know, it is a lot of work, but it is a lot of fun to be able to do stuff with each other, like we always talk about with community-based, okay? Um, so, again, I just thank each and every one of you for all you've done. Thanks.
Lord willing, next Sunday you will have an opportunity to give gifts to Abide in the Vine Disciples churches. And the reason I've asked for just a few minutes is I'm hoping I'm going to be able to clarify something, but you know how to get a hold of me if you leave here confused and I haven't done my job very well, okay? In the past, uh, what, I'm going to go back to about 2014 when I first made one of my first journeys to West Africa, Liberia, to do teaching. There were about 12 churches at that time that we were involved with, One Body, One Hope was involved with. At that time, it was feasible to think that we could pair up a church here with a church there, a partnership program. Today, there are 33 churches. This congregation has done a wonderful job of staying connected with the church in what we call Harbel, Dolo, and we've uh, done, through the power of the Spirit, we've done amazing things to support that congregation, some really neat relationships, and I, I don't want to suggest that we cut that off. It's just that there are a lot of other churches with needs, and so in transition, uh, the board at One Body, One Hope, of which I'm a part now, uh, made the decision that what we need to do is, at least for now, we need to send the money to the main campus under the leadership of Emmanuel Bimba, and then those pastors and those involved in church edu uh, Christian education will then take the monies that we will collect, like next Sunday, and they will distribute those according to the pressing needs of a given church. Uh, there are churches there that don't have a building. There are churches that don't have a roof. There are churches that can't afford to pay the salary of their pastor. And by the way, we can support a pastor in Liberia for about 150 U.S. dollars a month. Try that, Stanley. Anyway, um, the, the, the idea is, is that w what we're going to be doing at least for the foreseeable future is to send the money so that all the churches can benefit by it, not just the church in Harbell. So I want you to know that because it's a little confusing in the initial um, bulletin, it said next week Sunday uh, the offering was going to be for Abide in the Vine Harbell. I just want you to know it's not just for Harbell. The offering is for all of the AVDC churches in West Africa. Again, I just want to thank you for the support you've given. I want you to know once again, I'm available anytime, any questions you have. Some exciting things are happening right now in terms of the crusades that have taken place. If you haven't plugged into the uh, One Body, One Hope webpage, please do. There's some really fascinating things uh, that you will see in terms of what the Holy Spirit is doing in West Africa and in terms of church growth and expansion. And I also want to make mention the fact that Debbie Venthal is also on the board at One Body, One Hope. And you've got a couple of other members here who are on committees at One Body, One Hope. Des is one of them, DeVrace and Brad Coima is another. So um, feel free to grab any one of us. Anyway, thank you for your support. And just bear in mind, next Sunday, when you give, you're giving to all the churches of Abide in the Vine Disciples Church. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dan. $150, you can barely get a gorilla suit for that. I would like to invite uh, kids to come forward for a short children's message. So I'd say, uh, let's say kindergartners, uh, sure, kindergartners, first, second, third graders. If you're a little younger or a little older and want to come up too, that's absolutely fine. So come around, gather by these palm branches here. I can move over a little bit. Any kids who'd like to come forward, I want to share something with you for a couple of minutes. Thank you for coming up here. This is the second time for some of you. Thank you for being part of the service earlier. I really appreciate that. Hey, everyone, come on. There's plenty of space here for you. Lots and lots of room. Good to see you. Nice to see you all. Oh, look, and there's even more coming. Fantastic. We'll wait. Take your time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Pretty special service today. Why, what, what's today called again? 
Today it's called Palm Sunday, and uh, you know, I will admit that it is turning into a little bit of a long service, and I'm starting to get a little warm here, so I think before I do my children's message, I think I'm going to take my jacket off for a minute. <sighs> is something wrong? What's wrong with the back of my shirt? What? What's wrong with the back of my shirt? It's perfectly fine. <gasps> I put on a ripped shirt this morning instead of my usual shirt. Oh dear, don't I feel embarrassed. <laughs> How did that happen? Were you expecting that? No. Do you think they were expecting that? No. no. You know why I did that for? Why? I had this lovely suit jacket on and you'd think, oh, Pastor Stan, he's looking pretty fancy today. But was I fancy underneath? No. no. There's an old saying that says, don't judge a book by its cover. It sort of means that sometimes what's on the inside is different than what's on the outside. Or sometimes we can be fooled into thinking something is great when it's not. I think about how um, the devil tempts us with sin and the devil will say, you know what, you can tell a lie. Or you can steal that. Or you can say a bad word. It'll be fun. It'll be cool. But then you do it and then you end up hurting people, maybe ripping a relationship, maybe not ripping a shirt, but ripping a relationship. Or sometimes I think about how, you know, maybe somebody looks really cool on the outside and they got lots of toys and you're like, oh, I'll be friends with this person and they'll share with me and they'll be like, my toys, my stuff, you can't have it. <laughs> and so they look nice on the outside, but they're actually not very kind on the inside. And there was one time where I, I visited um, some children, it was quite a far, long ways away from here, but they were very poor and they had hardly anything. Like maybe they had one or two toys like for the whole village of kids. And you would think that if they only had one or two toys for so many kids, you'd think they would hang on to it real tight. But they didn't. They shared their toys with me and the other group and the rest of the group that came. So even though they didn't look like much on the outside, maybe they had tattered clothes, they actually had very beautiful hearts on the inside. So I wanted to remind you today that God looks at the inside of us and while it's lovely to have nice clothes and we can be thankful for that, it's even more important to have a beautiful heart on the inside and then that'll radiate outwards. Does that make sense? You know, can we do that all by ourselves in our own strength? We need God's help, don't we? If it weren't for God, we'd be ugly and tattered and ripped like my shirt. So let's pray to him and ask him to give us beautiful hearts on the inside. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for working in us and for the beautiful work of your Holy Spirit. Forgive us for when we do things or say things that are like tattered rags and, and rip and hurt. And forgive us for when we judge, for when we think we know something or can say something about a person when it's not actually true. We pray that you will lead and guide us in being your beautiful children outside, but even more importantly, on the inside. Work in our hearts so that we grow in loving you and in loving others. In Jesus' name and all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming up. You know the nice thing about this shirt? It's great air conditioning if it gets warm in here. But I, better, I think I'll put my jacket back on. It might be a little distracting if I keep it off. Thank you very much for coming up. I appreciate you being here. You are a great bunch and like to invite you to head back to your families or wherever it was you were sitting. Thank you for coming up. Oh, uh, kids who are off to children's worship, three, four, and five-year-olds, now would be a great time to do that as well. We continue in our series uh, about letting go. What is Christ inviting us to let go of uh, this Advent season, uh, Advent, sorry, this Lenten season? And this morning we are considering how Jesus is inviting us to let go of judgmentalism, of judging people. Uh, what's going on on the outside, as I said to the kids, maybe doesn't match what the Spirit is doing on the inside. That's part of it. We'll talk a little bit more of other things too, but talking about letting go of, oh, it says judgment. It should be a judgmentalism, actually. Uh, maybe judgment's fine too. Yeah, judgment, that's fine too. Letting go of being judgmental people. And uh, we're going to take as our cue 
the Spirit-inspired words of Matthew 26, verses 6 through 13. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we believe that your Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Matthew to accurately remember and record this incident between Jesus and this woman and the disciples. And we believe that your Holy Spirit is working in us, in our hearts and in our minds right now, that we can hear these words, let them sink deep into us, and allow them to change us so that through your Holy Spirit we become more and more like you. Amen. You may be surprised to hear this, but I was pretty loud as a kid. (laughs) Stan, the whole church, the whole restaurant, the whole neighborhood does not need to hear this conversation, I would be told. And I would often hear, Settle down, Stan. Be quiet. Some of you are looking at me going, I don't believe it. No, actually, none of you are looking at me that way now I think about it. Be quiet, Stan. Just stop making so much noise and settle down. I would, I would hear that perhaps more often than I would like to admit. Now, some participants in today's scripture lesson would say the same thing to the woman who poured expensive perfume on Jesus' head. Settle down there. Don't be so ridiculous. Stop making a scene. Stop it. You know how I know that they'd be saying those sorts of things? Because that's what I would be saying because I had been trained in hearing that and, and sometimes in very harsh ways and that sunk into me and and now that comes out of me, that which was poured into me sometimes as a kid. That, that just comes out quicker than sometimes I would like it to. But the other reason why I know that I would say a thing like that uh, is because, or that I know that they, sorry, the other reason why I know they would say something like that is because the Bible says so. The disciples, we read, were indignant. Why this waste? They said with great criticism and disdain. This woman, this woman does something extravagant for Jesus, but she is judged, and she is criticized and cut down. I wonder. This story leaves me asking two questions, and we'll kind of weave these questions through the rest of the message. It leaves me with two questions. I wonder, how often am I the one doing something extravagant for Jesus? How often am I like that woman? That's the one question the story leaves me with. The other question, how often am I the one doing the judging? Judging someone else who is doing something extravagant for Jesus and for his kingdom. How often am I not like the disciples? Those are the questions that I'm left with with this story. How often am I like the woman and how often am I like the disciples? And if I were to put those two on a scale, you know, I'm not sure I'd want to, actually. Let's dig into the text a little bit. Someone named Simon invites Jesus over for a meal. It's a time that I imagine of hearty food and, and hearty fellowship. But then out of the blue, a woman shows up with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she proceeds to pour on Jesus' head. Now, I remind you, and I say I remind you because we touched on these themes a couple of weeks ago, 
the women's place in Jesus' culture, in his time, in his place where he is, very different than today. It was very inappropriate for women to dine with a group of men, and especially in this Jewish context, a group of men discussing theology. That's something men did. Women didn't do that. It'd be very inappropriate for a woman to be part of that conversation. So that's inappropriate, but it's even more inappropriate. It's, it's very, very inappropriate for an uninvited woman to enter and interrupt that meal. It would be in, in, inappropriate for the woman to be there in the first place, but how much more inappropriate for someone to interrupt the meal and, and, and well, really make a scene. Everything just ground to a halt and made a scene. Maybe not with loudness, like telling Stan, be quiet, but definitely made a scene. And where people were there probably saying, settle down, what are you doing? Regardless, here comes a woman, obviously determined to show her gratitude and her love for Jesus. She holds nothing back. I love how Bible teacher Beth Moore describes the scene. She does not ask for Christ to come outside. She walks right through the door into the middle of the festivities. I imagine, I love this part here, I imagine the party that she crashed on earth gave way to a much grander one in heaven. I love that. The gospel writer Mark, he also uh, includes this story in his gospel, and he gives us uh, the, the detail that the woman breaks the jar and pours the perfume on Jesus' head. The jar is not just opened, so it could theoretically be closed up again. No, the jar is broken. That means it is no longer useful for storing anything. That means the entire amount of this very expensive perfume goes from the bottle on to Jesus. The whole amount, the whole song and dance, the whole ball of wax. Remember, this is a very expensive alabaster jar of perfume. It could have represented this woman's life savings. It could have been an inheritance that she treasured. It could be a little piece of security that she would hold on to, a piece of financial security she held on to in a very male-dominated culture. Maybe this gave her a little bit of clout. It's safe to say that she gives all she has, the most valuable of all things she has. She gives it all to Jesus. It's extravagant. It's even outrageous, this show of adoration and love. The Gospel writer John, he also uh, describes uh, this scene. And he identifies the woman. Matthew and Mark don't say the woman's name, but John identifies who this woman is. John identifies this woman as Mary. As Mary, the sister of Martha, the one who, remember two weeks ago, when I was up here, two weeks ago, um, the one who sat at Jesus' feet while Martha prepared a meal. This is the same Mary who is at Jesus' feet. Mary has been listening carefully to Jesus and his predictions of death. Oh, Jesus was very much aware of the fact that the crowd shouting Hosanna with the palm branches on Palm Sunday would in a few days be the ones who would want him dead, shouting, crucify him. And in a few days, he would be hanging on a cross. Even though the disciples, they seem to have no idea that such a shocking thing was so close at hand. But Mary, Mary, having been listening most closely to Jesus at his feet, Mary may have had some such insight. And so Mary leads us in understanding the gospel and in responding in gratitude. Based on Jesus' words that she had been listening to carefully, based on Jesus' words, she may actually be thinking, this is the last time Jesus will be with her. She may be thinking, it's now or never. And so she pours this very expensive perfume on Jesus. 
And this perfume uh, prepares Jesus' body for burial, as was the custom in the day. It may have been a fairly sizable alabaster jar, we're not sure, but it's possible that the sweet aroma may have lingered in Jesus' hair and on his body all the way through to Good Friday in that culture where there was no running water and daily showers and baths. Jesus maybe even still smells it while hanging on the cross as he makes a stinking world beautiful. He may still be smelling it then. Indeed, Jesus describes the woman's actions as beautiful. Jesus is not embarrassed by this, shall we say, social faux pas. Jesus does not rebuke her. Stop it. Knock it off. Save this for later. Shh, 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 shh. Nothing like that. On the contrary, Jesus praises her for this very good thing that she has done. I wonder if all of this was foreshadowed in the poetry of the Song of Songs where it says in the first chapter, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. Maybe she is fulfilling those words of poetry from all those centuries earlier. Now, as is obvious in the story, the disciples, the disciples certainly do not have poetry on their minds. They don't see anything artistic or beautiful about what is happening here. They watch the woman, they smell the perfume, and though it is a pleasing and wonderful odor, they are offended. The disciples are quick to point out that the woman's actions are inappropriate and even outrageous, and they call it a waste. It is a waste. And to justify their indignation, the disciples spiritualize their grievance. This perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Okay, there, justified our anger. Isn't that right, Jesus? You like talking about the poor, right? Now, I personally don't think that the disciples at this particular moment are concerned about the poor here at this point. And Jesus calls them out on it. You could have cared for the poor a hundred times today already, but now you complain about this one woman choosing not to get a life. It's kind of what Jesus says. Jesus does not say that giving to the poor is pointless or unnecessary. Not at all. Jesus quotes from God's law. There will always be some in the land who are poor. Now, there's a period there, but the disciples, the Jewish people of that day, would know that that's only half the verse. And Jesus was indeed saying that half the verse, but most certainly as a teacher, he had the entire verse in mind. What's the entire verse? Oh, we know the first half, but we we don't have the second half memorized, do we? There will always be some in the land who are poor. That is why I am commanding you to share freely with the poor and with other neighbors in need. Period. There's where the period is. And everyone listening to Jesus that morning or afternoon or whenever it was, evening, would have known that that was only half of the verse and they would have filled in the rest themselves. And so Jesus is saying, yes, caring for the poor is very, very high on God's list of priorities for his people. But worshiping God with all that we have is one small step higher, especially if the time is short. And instead of joining the woman and worshiping the one who will soon suffer and die for them, the disciples are crunching numbers and judging. They see waste. Now, just in case I really have to spell this out for you, I kind of guess I don't, but forgive me for stating the obvious. But friends, in our story today, the disciples are not the heroes, okay? The disciples are not the heroes in our story today. Where there is worship, the disciples see waste. Where there is beauty, the disciples only smell stinking. And where there is gospel, the disciples only respond with judgment. You know, it's even worse than that. Sadly, if you plunked me down into the middle of that story, 
I can't guarantee you, but I would suspect that I would probably be like the disciples, voicing my disapproval. And if my parents or siblings were here, they'd probably say, and you'd probably be doing it loudly too and sticking your foot in your mouth in the process. (laughs) I would probably be like the disciples. I'd probably be like the disciples, voicing my disapproval. I would have been the one saying, kind of echoing those words I sometimes heard growing up, settle down there. Stop being so ridiculous. You're causing a scene. Stop it, stop it, stop it. I can kind of hear myself saying that. Oh, I read this story and it makes me cringe about how Jesus openly blesses all and indeed all who come to him, whereas I more often secretly prefer to judge them. Jesus openly blesses, I more often prefer to secretly judge. If judgmentalism was a fruit of the Spirit, (laughs) I could lead classes, I'm sure, on that. While Jesus teaches and models humble gratitude, how often isn't my position more one of of proud entitlement? Especially around people who don't have it all together like I think I do. Or maybe around people whose theology is a little bit different than mine. Maybe when it comes to things like infant baptism or perhaps welcoming believers with same-sex attraction. Ooh. Maybe especially around people who express their faith differently than I do. Maybe playing different instruments, waving hands and dancing in worship. Maybe in more formal ways, maybe in more informal ways. I am quick to feel entitled and looking at others who do little differently than I do, I am quick to judge. And boy, oh boy, does the devil ever love it when I choose to judge others for their ridiculous adoration of Christ rather than to imitate and match that adoration myself. (laughs) The devil's having a heyday. So today, and in this Lenten season, Jesus invites me, and I know I'm not the only one, Jesus invites you, Jesus invites me and you to let go of judgmentalism especially when it's comparing ourselves to other Christians, to other followers of Jesus, to other people. Today, Jesus invites you and me to be a bit more like that Palm Sunday crowd. See that? I see the palm branches. I don't know if you can still see them up here on the floor. Jesus is inviting us to be a little less judgmental and a little bit more like that Palm Sunday crowd, willing to be bold and boisterous and maybe sometimes even shout, Hosanna! Can I hear an amen? There we go. I say that a little bit humorously because in North American culture, also maybe even more particular in in Christian Reformed Church culture, we often value intelligence over emotion. We're quicker to appreciate logic but get nervous when people get a little too emotional, don't we? So the fact is is that we may sometimes be lonely in responding uh, in love to Jesus with extravagance like the woman in today's story. Sometimes that might feel lonely because there may be others who, like the disciples, will say, what are you doing? You're ridiculous. I love how this one author puts it. The world has never had a problem with religion in moderation. The world has never had a problem with religion in moderation. The world certainly has no problem with too much wealth or power or sex, or influence, or patriotism, or sports, or technology. No problem with too much of that. But it does have a problem with too much religion. Jesus, in stark contrast, invites me to enter into an extravagant spiritual life, one that other people might judge and say is kind of ridiculous. But that's what Jesus invites me to. And I remind myself that I can extravagantly love Jesus and desire to do so. Why? Well, simply because he first extravagantly loved me. By Christ's power, our old selves are crucified, put to death, and buried with him so that we may offer ourselves as an extravagant sacrifice of gratitude to him. 
The Holy Spirit who prompts the woman's affection for Jesus in today's story also works in you and in me to bring our adoration and our devotion to Jesus, even when it is sacrificial and costly, whether it's financially or socially or in some other way that it costs us something and maybe it hurts a bit, even if some label it as ridiculous. Jesus welcomes me to show by my life and my words and my actions my love for him in response to his extravagant, even ridiculous, love for me. Wow. So let's not judge others for doing the same, but maybe in different ways than we would. Jesus welcomes the unconventional woman in our story So how about we avoid being gatekeepers, judging and keeping others out? And instead, let's love and welcome others as we have been loved and welcomed by Jesus. Let's let the truth of Scripture sink into us as the praise team comes forward and leads us in a song of welcoming. Um, I'd like to invite you to rise in body or spirit to sing. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, Son of God and Son of David, you entered Jerusalem with a triumphal procession that left you alone and in humiliation on the cross. As we sung, your cross stands as witness and as symbol of the Father's grace. And so we praise you and we thank you for your selfless sacrifice and for your work as it continues in our lives, in our community, in our world. 
We thank you for your redemption, your gift to us, unworthy as we are. As we experience your compassion and welcome, make us quick to welcome others into our lives, our neighborhoods, and our church, even when they are a little or a lot different than us. Forgive us, we pray this morning, of our judgmentalism, our hypocrisy, our tendency to deceive others and even ourselves. In their place, grow within us the fruit of kindness, gentleness, sincerity, and righteousness. By the power of your Spirit, make us look and sound more and more like you every day. We thank you for the many different parts that make up your body, the church. We pray for us as a group and as individuals in our joys and our struggles. We thank you for Crew and TC Ed's big show this past week, for the talents of our teens, for the leadership of the adults, for the delicious food and hearty fellowship. We thank you for your protection over Lucas this past week, and we pray that the soreness from his fall and injury will continue subsiding. We thank you that Rachel could return home again, and with uh, her long road ahead of her, we continue praying for healing and restored strength. We thank you that Ty's surgery was successful. We pray that he too will recover quickly and that his hip will be restored to the way it's supposed to be. We pray for your help and strength for those of us who are journeying through cancer. This morning we lift up before you Gary and Marcy and Gail and Shar, who um, are beginning a new set of treatments again. We pray for strength and courage for them. We lift up those of us who come here sad this morning, who are carrying grief. We pray for Zach and Stacy and Christopher, Grayson, Laura, and Amelia as they said goodbye to uh, Grandpa and Great Grandpa last week. Comfort them with the assurance that comes from your presence and your eternal promises. For those of us dealing with trauma, for those of us who feel lonely or isolated, for those of us living with a sense of fear or dread of the future, we pray for the comfort and strength that you alone can provide to help us face each day. We pray that you'll guide us in holiness, wisdom, and love in our activities this week. Help the council fulfill its calling as we meet tomorrow. Bless our various ministries for kids and adults. Prepare our hearts to journey to the cross with you on Good Friday and to celebrate your destruction of sin and death on Resurrection Sunday. We pray for your world and for your people working in it. Bless our offerings for ministry shares, TC Ed, and next week for the Abide in the Vine Disciples Churches in Liberia. Use these offerings to bless people and grow your kingdom near and far. We thank you for Taryn's work in Central Africa. May she and her teammates find joy and direction in you each day. And this morning we lift up before you JFA and their partner Mississippi Christian Family Services and all who are devastated by tornadoes over the past week or so. We pray that you'll strengthen your people there as they help restore what was damaged and lost. And in the wake of another school shooting, we cry out for mercy. Your mercy is needed for we are a people who keep proving we're helpless to curb gun violence temper our despair, and lead us and those in power to make good choices that effectively reduce the prevalence of these murders. Trouble us until we as individuals, as a church, and as a culture choose life in our words and deeds, in our systems and policies. In your mercy, do not leave us where we are here, how you find us. And so indeed, we wait for your kingdom to come in fullness in our world and in our lives. We long for your throne. We hunger for your reconciliation for that day when people from every tribe and every tongue will gather around you and sing, Hosanna! Lord Jesus, Son of God and Son of David, remind us that all the parts are needed in your body and the church, that each of us is unique and has a role to play in building the authentic, compassionate, growing, and worshiping community to which you call us. Teach us to celebrate that we are united not through our sameness, but through your blood shed on the cross. Oh Jesus, for who you are and what you do for us, for how you name us, claim us, and teach us, for how you treasure us, grow faith within us, and welcome us. We love you. Amen.
important reminders as we leave from here. Uh, first of all, if you are a parent or grandparent of a kid in children's worship, um, instead of them coming up, actually we're asking uh, you to go down to their classroom and pick them up this morning. So those of you who have kids in children's worship, please go down and find them. That's first, I got four announcements. That's the first one. Second one, all kids are going down to Sunday school following the service. Sometimes some of you come up to sing. Not this morning. This morning you all go down to your classes. You'll return up to the worship center to practice some singing a little bit later. So that's the second thing. All kids go to Sunday school after service. Third thing, a reminder that we gather here again uh, this evening and then again Good Friday evening at 7 o'clock for our Good Friday service. And that service includes celebrating the Lord's Supper. Um, essentially, the message this morning was the entire uh, time of preparing for the Lord's Supper, inviting the Holy Spirit to work in us that we, with great uh, enthusiasm, uh, express our gratitude for God, to Jesus Christ, for his suffering and death on the cross for us, as unworthy as we are, but also, as we think about that vertical relationship, also the horizontal, that as Christ has loved us, that does not leave us unchanged, and that love pours out into others. And so the Spirit is equipping us today to be a little less judgmental and a little more welcoming and caring to the people around us for it is only then that we can in sincerity and authenticity gather at the table where christ welcomes all all of his people to come and say you belong you are named you are claimed you are mine i love you so we go from this place equipped by the holy spirit in our walk with god in exuberance and and joy and in loving one another uh, with kindness and compassion so that was the third thing, Good Friday. And finally, fourth, uh, Easter breakfast and praise choir rehearsal next week Sunday. Uh, come here anytime uh, around 8 or after 8 o'clock for breakfast. I didn't have it written down here, but there's also the Easter sunrise service at 645 at St. Mary's Church. Then 8 o'clock here for breakfast. Everyone is also welcome to be part of the praise choir. That practice will begin here in the, pra in the worship center at 815. And if you've forgotten any of the things that I just told you, come find me afterwards. I can repeat any of that for you. We go from this place assured and confident that we go not alone, but with our God who welcomes us with open arms, claiming and calling us his children and equipping us to reflect him and his welcoming grace today and in the week ahead. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the deep and wonderful, can we even say sometimes ridiculous looking love of God the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you today, throughout this holy week, and forever. And together, sisters and brothers in Christ say, Amen.